longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. We want to give you a special welcome this morning for our service coming to you live from IVC Eldoret. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Wherever you're tuning in from, we welcome you to follow this subject with us this morning. Thank you so much, worship team. The Lord bless you very much for good work. It's a joy to be with you again, and as we look into the subject matter this uh, morning, we are looking onto a subject I'm calling Holding to Your Faith. Holding to Your Faith. In this life, there are things you can afford to lose, but you cannot afford to lose faith. In whatever thing, when you enter a car to drive, you have faith that the car will take you where you're going. When food is served to you on the dining table, you have faith that the food will give you nutrients for your body to be well. When you come home and go to bed, you have faith you love sleep and wake up the following morning. That's why you plan your life for the following day. You cannot afford to lose faith. Biblically speaking, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I would like you to mark the first three words. Now faith is... You can play with those three words. You can say, now faith is. Or, faith is now. It is faith, it is now. Now it is. Now faith is. Now, taking these words to a very, very core of our lives in terms of whatever we do, in everything we engage in, whether we confess it or not, whether we call it faith or we don't, this is a principle you cannot ignore. Hold on to your faith. Now, when you lose faith in something or somebody, then the relationship is broken. When there is a loss of faith in anybody or in anything, then there is going to be a brokenness of relationship. And these are serious matters that need attention. I will give you some scriptures to look at. Then I come to the core of this matter. Now, you may not be a church goer. You may not even be a Christian. Uh, let me read these scriptures. Then I'll come to some matters which you will appreciate in terms of uh, whatever you believe in, whatever faith you belong to, wh whatever level of society at which you are. Um, after I read these scriptures, I need your attention on the things I will be saying. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 5, the Amplified Version of the Bible says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they continually increased in number day after day. Strengthened in faith. What the scripture is pointing at is this. Your faith needs to be strengthened, not to die. Strengthened in faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I want to make sure I read this scripture so that I can be clear. Chapter 16, verse 13. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. From verse 12. As for our brother Apollos, I have strongly encouraged him to visit you with the other brothers. It was, not, it was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when he has the opportunity. Verse 13, be on guard, stand firm in your faith. In other words, in God, respecting his precepts and keeping your doctrine, uh, your, do your doctrine sound. Act like mature men and be courageous, be strong. Be strong, be courageous. And what the, what the Apostle Paul is saying is this. Stand firm. 
in your faith. These scriptures are going to help us understand the things I'm going to say. Stand firm in your faith. Now when it says stand firm, there is an opposite you can put to that. It can say it this way, st don't stand weak in your faith. Whenever you read scripture, there is what you call the thesis and the anti-thesis. The thesis is what it is. The anti-thesis is the opposite. So when it says stand firm in your faith, the opposite is stand weak in your faith. You can actually be weak in your faith. That's not a good thing, a good place to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Join that with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. This is the Apostle Paul. Test and evaluate, evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourself, not me. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves by an ongoing experience that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you failed the test and are rejected as counterfeit. What the Apostle Paul is saying is this, test and evaluate yourself about your faith. This is calling for personal examination about the faith that you carry. And I'm saying this because of the times in which we are. This is the time for you to look at your faith again. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 25. Listen to this scripture the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi. Verse 25. Since I'm convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for the progress and joy in the faith. Paul is saying there is a progress and there is a joy that needs to be made in the faith. It's a very serious matter I want to deal with this morning because it's good for you to understand. And this is why we did this song, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Paul is saying very, very important things. Say, check your faith. There is progress that is expected. Earlier on, Paul had said, for him to die is better than go to heaven. But he wanted to be alive for the sake of the church in Philippi. And then he says he wanted to see progress in terms of faith. I met many people today in this world. I mean, they talk about being Christians. They talk about being this faith or believing in this, this church, this denomination. And um, my challenge to all of them is progress in terms of faith. Colossians chapter 2. Many scriptures this morning. But I believe very useful for what you want to do. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in union with him, reflecting his character in the things you do, and say, living lives that lead others away from sin, having been deeply rooted in him, and now being continually built up in him, and in becoming increasingly more established in your faith just as you were taught and overflowing in it with gratitude look at this established in your faith overflowing in your faith i'm bringing this forth because of the challenges and the pressure humanity is facing the apostle paul is saying increase in your faith overflow in the same this is critical in what you do. Paul again writes to a young pastor, a very young man uh, who, was, who was called by the name Titus. He was given a church. A young man being told to establish a church. And he's being told, bring this church to a place of order. Because the church in that area had no order. And Paul was telling Titus, don't worry about your age. What I want you to do is this. Put elders in place in the church. It's, a, it's an interesting story. When you read the book of Titus and you look at the life of Titus, young but was able to be entrusted with ministry. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says to Titus uh, in the book of Titus chapter 1 and verse 13. 
He gives them an instruction. The description is true. So rebuke them sharply so that they'll be sound in the faith and free from doctrinal error. A young pastor being instructed, go to the church, establish eldership, bring a rebuke, bring correction so that the people are established in the faith. In the faith. The concept here really is being stable in the faith that they believed in. Peter writes in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, chapter 5, sorry. Um, Peter was uh, actually the leader of the church after Christ left. And Peter writes very short letters, two of them. Verse, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, he says this, Be sober, in other words, well balanced and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. Verse 9, but resist him. Be firm in your faith. Brackets, against this attack. Rooted, established, immovable. Knowing that the same experience, experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. In other words, you do not suffer alone. Now what is Paul saying is there is a devil out there, an enemy coming like a roaring lion. He is not a lion, but comes like one, prowling, looking for you, looking for your health, your finances, looking for everything that has to do with you, your family, to destroy it. And he says, but be strong in your faith. And these are serious matters. I would like you to keep them in mind that you need to stand firm in faith. So what I'm going to do at this point is to try and uh, explain why we must stand firm in the faith. Because we, we are not instructed to do things for nothing. Actually, when you understand the why of anything, the how becomes easy. Whatever accompanies it does not become as complicated as it may look or seem to be. Why then must we stand firm in our faith? Number one, to deal with surprises of life. We need to stand firm in faith because this life has surprises. Very serious surprises. We meet things no human explanation can be given for them. And yet, we meet them. They happen to our families. They happen in our places of work, in our businesses. Things we cannot explain. Issues that are difficult. At times we try to, to try to look for why things are the way they are. The more we try, the more complicated they become. Why Corona? Why? Can you explain that? It's a complex thing. Why loss of jobs right now? You know, why economy is going down? Why? These are complexities of life, the challenges we meet in this life. Now, can you imagine the whole world, majorly speaking, churches are not meeting. Businesses are not as vibrant as they have always been. People are dying and being buried in 24 hours or 8 hours. No more decent burials and no more ceremonies. Can you imagine that? There are communities in this country called Kenya. I never imagined this can happen. Somebody can die and is buried in 24 hours. This, these are things you cannot explain. And because you cannot explain them, the only way you can live with them is to be rooted in your faith. To stand firm in your faith. Yesterday, a friend of mine, I was chatting with him, a man I respect, and he was asking me, what is the Lord saying about this corona? What are you tapping in the spirit? You know what I told him? I don't know. I don't understand. I have no idea what it is. Because I don't know how to explain it. Now, 
there are times when we want to sound very spiritual. We want to sound like we are very, you know, we are from heaven in terms of the answers. So when we try to explain, or oh, maybe the world needed a change, or oh, maybe the church was misbehaving, or, oh, you know, people are trying to bring different answers and explanations. We understand all those and we appreciate them. But as for me, when I don't understand it, when I don't know what it is, I remain as simple as possible. We have to deal with surprises of life. It is not even, it could be the Antichrist, it could be a virus, it could be demonic things involved, I don't know. But since I do not know, I still want to remain firm in my faith that nothing is going to change around me because of these issues that are happening. I remember the life of Job. Job was a man, he was not a poor man. The man had some wealth. A good number of children, sons and daughters, camels, goats, sheep. One day the devil went before God and God bragged about Job and God said, have you seen my servant Job? A man of integrity. Job told, I mean, told, the devil told God, you know, Job follows you because you have protected him. And God gave the devil permission. And he came to the life of Job and began to torment Job. Surprises of life. Out of nowhere. I mean, imagine, out of nowhere. Children are dead, all of them. Out of nowhere. Animals are gone. Things are just happening. I mean, Job had nine months of experience that you don't want to go through. Now, Job had no control on what he was going through. It was an experience of life for which Job had no control. He could not explain it. He could not control it. Children died. Animals went. Him, his body was hit. In the midst of that, Job realized, this is something I have no control over. So what do I do? I keep my faith. The wife told him, curse God and die. You know, Job said, you're just speaking like other foolish women. Don't go there. Even if he slays me, I'll trust him. Can you imagine that? Property is gone. Children are gone. Everything is gone. The body is aching. Your friends, I mean, his friends were talking about him. They came and stood at a distance. And they began to have a dialogue, a conversation with Job. Some of them began to explain, Oh, Job, you are suffering because you sinned. Or because of this. And Job was replying to them. Until it came to a point where now the conversation stopped and God took over. Ladies and gentlemen, there are things which are surprises in this life. Job was surprised. I don't know about you, but we are living in a time where the economy is being hit hard. Talk to economists. The GDP is going down. The GNB is going down. Investments are going down. In this country and all over the world, factories are sucking people. Jobs are being lost today. It's a reality. It's a surprise. Who can control the jobs now? Who will control what is happening? In the midst of all that, Job said, even if he slays me, I'll still believe in him. What do you do when a spouse walks away? A man who married you walks away, abandons you and leaves you with children. And he goes to begin another family. It's happening. Do you live in, you know, in grief for the rest of your life? You don't have control over that. That's a decision of somebody. What you need to do therefore is to know that you've got faith and you can hold on to your faith. The pressure is there. The challenges are there. But you can understand that this is life, the surprises of life, 
some of them you really don't have any control over them job had no control over the calamities he went through but he held on his faith and the word integrity is attached to job he maintained his integrity because he held on to his faith and that gave him a way into the future because after that God remembered Job and God blessed Job more than in the past isn't God so faithful I met a gentleman in America one time and he gave a testimony in a meeting he said he's just like Job and he explained the number of children they had, who had died I do not remember the number exactly but I know there were not less than five he lost those children more than five died and later on had an equal number of children this is a mystery I looked at him in the meeting and I said are you are you are you trying to use job as an example he said no this is me surprises of this life job had no explanation when you look at the life of Joseph very interestingly this man had a dream he saw himself being a leader he saw his family bowing to him he didn't understand the details it was a vision it was a dream things began to happen to Joseph after he explained his vision and his dream to his brothers the Bible says they hated him even the more Joseph one day the father sent him to his brothers to go and find out how they were doing in the field when they saw him they said here comes the dreamer and you know what the brothers did to him they took his gown his nice beautiful clothing killed an animal dipped that gown in the blood of the animal they put Joseph in a pit ladies and gentlemen what could Joseph do could he control that could he explain that was he responsible for that I don't think Joseph told them put me in the pit he didn't they did it themselves these are situations it happened to him he could not explain he was not responsible for it he was not in control of it but it happened put in a pit and Reuben wanted to save his life <laughs> people came the caravan came you know heading to Egypt the brothers sold their own brother and he, he went out of their hands out of the father's hands Joseph found himself in Egypt but let me tell you something even in the pit Joseph still believed I've not read that in scripture but if you do that this story then as you follow the narrative very well you understand how Joseph navigated the whole process you discover this man knew there was a God in heaven in Egypt he was taken to Potiphar's house and you know the story I believe he was lied upon by Potiphar's wife cheated I mean arrested and taken to prison in the prison the man still believed God in Potiphar's house he still had faith in God he told Potiphar's wife I cannot sin against my God the situation here you see in Joseph you see a man who had faith even in the pit even in the prison the situation he went through he could not explain he could not control he was not responsible for but he went through it at the end of the day he interpreted dreams for some people the dreams came to pass just as Joseph had explained but you know what he was forgotten can you imagine how you can help people and they forget you how many people have you helped and supported 
and they never cared about you. I've invested in so many people. Uh, I don't like talking about it because investing in somebody's life is a privilege God gives. And you do not do it so that they can, they can reward you or tell you thank you or give you money or clap for you. That's never the motive. But it's nice when you invest in people and you see them progress with life and maintain grateful hearts. That one, once upon a time, you were useful in their lives. But as I was saying, at times you invest in people and tomorrow they abuse you. That happens. Joseph invested, interpreted dreams. This guy came out, the cupbearer, went back to South Pharaoh, and for two years, he forgot what Joseph had done. Joseph continued to live as a prisoner, but still maintaining faith. When the right time came, Joseph came out of prison and he became the leader of Egypt. In fact, the Bible says he became the father of Pharaoh. That word father is actually like the one giving Pharaoh direction and the whole country. He began to give the whole nation direction. Why? He was able to navigate surprises of life by sustaining his faith. Naomi and her husband left their home, Bethlehem, to go to the land of Moab because there was hunger, there was no food in the land. This story is found in the book of Ruth. The story is long, I, can't I don't want to read the whole of it. But this man, a man called Elimelech, with his wife called Naomi, and their two sons, Mahlon and Kilion, they went to Moab. And when they got to Moab, the two boys married in Moab. The two boys died, Naomi's husband died. Surprises of life. This is my, my, my my question to you, was Naomi responsible for their death? Could she explain their deaths? Could she answer questions on why they died? No, she couldn't. And so she came back home and came back with one of the daughters-in-law. The other one went back, Orba went back. Um, but Ruth decided to accompany Naomi back to Bethlehem because now there was food in Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. Now when they got to Bethlehem, when they saw Naomi coming, people celebrated Naomi is back. She said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Naomi means pleasant or beautiful or agreeable. Mara means bitter or bitterness. Look, Naomi was taking a blame she was having guilt for what happened. It was like she was saying, do not call me pleasant. I'm guilty. Look at what happened to my husband, to my, to my two sons. In other words, Naomi, from this story, it appears, and uh, I don't want to be conclusive, but it appears like Naomi was, be, was feeling guilt or feeling guilty for what had happened to her husband, to her children, she, maybe she was blaming herself. Why did I ever leave to go to Moab? And this is what happens to many of us. We go through experiences, surprises of life, and we blame ourselves. We invite guilt. We invite feelings of personal condemnation. Maybe I should have done better. Maybe I should have avoided Maybe, uh, maybe I caused it. Maybe I aggravated it. This is where Naomi seems to be. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me agreeable. Don't even call me um, beautiful. Just call me bitter or bitterness because of the things I have done or the things I have caused to happen. This is a dangerous place to be in as a human, particularly in moments like this. 
They are, you, you see, what happened to Naomi and family, she was not really, she cannot explain. But it happened. She's not responsible for it. But it happened. And so you, you, have, to, you have to understand that life brings surprises. And you can navigate these surprises if and only if you maintain and sustain your faith. Number two, you are safe in God's hands. Sustaining faith is important because it keeps you in the arms of God. It, it makes sure that you are not trusting people or trusting other things. You are in the hands of God. As I've shown you earlier, Naomi lost her husband and lost her children. She didn't expect it. And she came back home, Bethlehem, the homeland where God was ruling. We are safe in the hands of God. Whatever happens, as long as we are in the hands of God, we are safe. Now the challenge, uh, uh, there are some things I would like to say which may be a bit hard and painful, but the challenge with the humanity is that we do not expect bad things to happen. We don't. That's why when a spouse dies, people are devastated. Because they don't expect it. Hey, listen, the Bible is very clear. A human being is like a flower. It can dry any moment. I mean, the scripture is like, your days are, are known by God. Some people die young, others die old. I mean, people can die any time. Our problem is we do not expect them to die. And so we grieve forever. Painfully grieving and our lives are tied up because we don't expect them. We don't expect the surprises of life. I, I want to say this, uh, but I want you to think about it. Can you live without those people around you? Can you live? You need, you need to know that the place you are safe is the hands of God not the hands of man I want you to understand this because human beings seem to seem to focus on now and they seem to think everything will be as now who knew a day will come there will be no church services on Sunday I mean since I was born this has never happened Human beings expect things to remain the same throughout. And so, when the surprises come, they just don't know what to do. Now, that's why they get depressed. Some of them will enter depression. Some of them will actually even commit suicide. Because they don't expect it to happen. Hey, let me tell you something. One of the things I normally do, I normally reflect and say, suppose so and so was not present in my life. Would I handle it? This point is so critical, I may not exhaust it fully. But let me ask you a question. Whom do you trust? In whose hands are you? I want to say something that may shock you. I trust nobody but God. Anybody can go. Anybody can go. Anybody can either go or die anytime. And if my life is anchored in a person, when the person dries and dies, then my life is gone. So I don't do that. Now listen, I love people. I respect people. I honor people. I cannot survive without people. But my trust is not in people. My trust is in God. That's where my safety is. So I can navigate pressure. I can navigate discouragements. I can navigate tough times because my trust 
is in God. And because of this, I believe I am safe. I remain in God's hands. I'm safe. There's a song that says, says safe in the arms of Jesus. What a beautiful hymn. Safe in the arms of Jesus. I'll pick up from here in our next session. Because it's important for you to understand that the Bible says, cast is one who puts his trust in man. Man can drop dead now. The one you believe in, the one you trust. He can go now. I'll never forget this story. Very, very painful story. A man left just the other year, drove from his house, going to work. Not far from home, in Nairobi, got involved in an accident. His car rolled, rushed to hospital. Family went to hospital to see him. He looked at them lying on his bed, closed his eyes and he was dead. Left home to work, left family having breakfast. In a few minutes he was dead. The family got to the hospital, he was gone. Where is your trust? We are safe in the arms of Jesus. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I know God can split the sea before me so that I can walk right through it. Because in him, I trust. I put my confidence, I put my trust in God himself. Thank you so much for joining us in this service. We want to encourage you to put your trust in God. Hold on to your faith. It doesn't matter what is happening around you. God is still on the throne. God bless you very much. Thank you for tuning in. If Jesus is not yet your Lord and Savior, I want to welcome you to receive him as a friend, as a Savior. It's very simple. You just say, Jesus, come in my heart. Forgive me my sins. Write my name in the book of life. Once you, do, once you make that kind of prayer, Jesus forgives all your sins. You become a child of God. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm inviting you back home to Christ. If you're sick, I pray for healing over your body. I command that pain to leave your body. I command the cancer to go. I command that stomach issue to stop. I command your heart problem to end. I command your diseases and your pains to live in the name of Jesus. God is faithful. I command your children back home, those who are rebellious. I pray that God is going to expand your business. God is going to keep your job safe and secure. I pray that doors will open before you which no man can open except God. I pray that your days will be many as you serve him and invest in the kingdom of God. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord sustain you. May the Lord uphold you and uphold your family. You'll be given instructions on how you can give your offerings and your tithes on the screen. God bless you very much as you do so. We believe in giving our tithes and offerings. The pay bill number will be on the screen. The bank account is on the screen. Let us move together as we carry on the agenda of God on this earth. It is God who gives us power to make wealth that we may establish his covenant. God bless you. See you next week.
no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I want us to look at this song again uh, and as we do it, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I want you to think about the things that are eating you up now. Are you in debt? Loans? Struggling to care for your family? Getting deep? Deeper and deeper into the hole? You don't need to fear. I'm no longer a slave. You unravel me. The Lord can unravel you with a melody. And this morning, wherever you are, this can happen to you. Can we do this song? You unravel me. You unravel me with a melody. With a melody. You surround, you surround me with a song of deliverance. Of sit over there watching this program you are a child of God you are not alone May God bless you as you stand strong and maintain faith thank you